just as with confidence intervals, we have multiple formulas for sample size, and the key will be to know which one to use when. Now, before we even get into that, however, how can you tell it's a sample size question versus a confidence interval question? And that can be particularly tricky. Now, you want to look for the question words of how many or what sample size or something similar to that. But be warned, there will also be confidence mentioned. So that's the key. So let me make a note. Warning. Confidence will be mentioned, but you have to look for the question words. Confidence intervals will be mentioned. Right. So confidence intervals will be mentioned, but look for the question words. If all it does, if all the problem does is say, construct this interval, do it, right? Do, do this thing, construct this interval, then you're doing a confidence interval question. If it says, how many do I need in order to construct the confidence interval? That's a how many question. That's a sample size question. So watch out. They'll both mention confidence. They'll both mention confidence intervals, but the actual setting up question word will be how many, how much, what sample size, right? It can um, also be how much, I should answer. How many, how much, how big a sample, right? Those are sample size questions. All right, now there are three sample size formulas. So let me go to the exam notes packet. Again, I usually make it yellow in my course pack, so yellow packet, exam notes packet. And we can see there are three separate formulas. So we can just write them. There's this one with the p hat and the q hat, there's this one with the 0.25, and there's this one down here. Okay, so let me write those in. So we have p hat times q hat. Now I don't want, the formula actually doesn't write the times, but that's because I wrote them and I'm a mathematician and mathematicians never bother with the times dots. They're too lazy. <laughs> so, but they're there. It's multiplying as opposed to 0.25 times Z alpha over two over the error squared or S times Z alpha over two over the error squared right, to the two power. All right, those are the three formulas. Now, how are you going to know which one's which? Um, what are we going to look for? Okay, so for this one, this is for proportions. It's for proportions and there's a prior estimate. There's some previous old p hat that we can use. So we will do so, right? So there's a pre hat, right? It's for proportions. These top two ones are for proportions. The bottom one is for means. All right, so this will be for proportions or percents, proportions. It'll have, and so will this one, right? And remember proportions are often written, written as a percent, so percent. This one will have no prior estimate down here, the middle one, with no prior p hat given. And this one will have a prior p hat given. It'll have an old p hat. Right? The way we say it is prior, meaning in the past, estimate. So in other words, there'll be an old p hat given in the problem. So if there's an old p hat given in the problem, that looks like it's one word, but it's not. It's an old p hat. There we go. I fixed it. <laughs> old p hat given. And that's the word prior. No prior old p hat given. All right. Now, this where, where are they from? Well, they're both from section um, 9.4 officially. Technically, it's actually from section 9.1 if you actually opened up a real textbook. Um, but I took those apart and took them out of section 9.1. But they are officially from 9.1. 
Now, where are you going to get them? Well, they're in this yellow packet, in this exam notes packet. Now, my current semester, it's page 237, but that changes from semester to semester. So go to your exam notes packet in the semester you are watching this in and put what your page number is, and it's the top left formula on that page, right? It's in the top left. And then this is the top right formula on that page. So put your page number. Again, for my current semester, it's page 237, but that varies depending on what semester you're watching it in. Now, how can you tell it's these ones versus this one? Well, this one is very unique because this one will talk about the averages, right? It'll talk about the mean or average, not proportions. All the rest of the ones we're going to learn are, are with proportions. This is the only one that works with means. And the other key is that S, which is the sample standard deviation, has to be given. So if you see a standard deviation, which is S, given to you in the problem, that it has to be this one. There is no other formula it could be. Now again, I put them into section 9.4, but actually it's officially from section 9.2. If you open up the textbook, that's where it would, become, it would come from. I just took it out of there because I thought those sections 9.1 and 9.2 were too long as they were, so I made it its own section. Now it's whatever page you're watching this on. Um, so for me right now it's 237, but that can vary depending on your semester. But it's the middle formula on the page, right? right here. It's the one for a mean. So I'll say um, the middle box in the center of the page, <laughs> right? It's the third formula on the page. All right. Now, you'll notice that all three of these formulas involve Z alpha over 2, all of them. It never changes, so it's always Z alpha over 2. So how do you find Z alpha over 2? Well, the instructions for that are in your exam notes packet, right here in the very large font, how to find critical Z values, right? Stat crunch, stat calculator's normal, click between. That's the big mistake people make. So whatever page this is on, for me right now it's 234, but for you it might be different depending on when you're watching this. So make a note, page whatever, it's the top box. Right? That's where to get the instructions for yourself on how to find your critical Z values. Now some other things about n, about sample size. Sample size is weird because it's the only time in our class that no matter what, we round up. We round up to the nearest whole number. The rest of the class, literally every other calculation we've ever done, we do regular rounding. Right? We look to the next decimal place. If it's five and higher, we go up. If it's four and below, we go down. But this is rounding up, always. It's the only time we do it like that. All right, now some other issues. Error. So the margin of error has to be given. Error, right here, see how they have an E in the denominator like this? So what I'm talking about here is that is the error that's given. So error. It will be given to you as a percent a lot of times in proportion problems. It's very, very, very common, right? So in proportion ones only, which is these two up here, you have to change your error, which is given as a percent, into a decimal. See, the thing about percents is percents are how we talk about numbers, but they're not useful for formulas. They can't, they're not mathematically um, workable. So let me give you an example here. If I give you the error is, oh, and how will you know the error? The error will be given to you with the word within. So let me, let me highlight that. Error is often the word within. 
So if you see within in the problem, then that will be your error. So let me give you an example. Suppose they tell you they want within 2.5%. What that means is that the error is 2.5%, but that means that it's 0 0.025. We have to move the decimal two spots over from where it was. Sorry, I was unhappy that my, my decimal point got merged with my two there, so I fixed it. <laughs> so if you make 2.5% into 0 0.025, this is the error that you're going to use in the formula. But you only do this for proportion problems, only. So formulas one and two. Not for formula number three. Number three doesn't need this because number three, the error is not given as a percentage usually. Um, so you don't have to worry about it. You only have to worry about it for these two because these two often give the error as a percent. Okay. Um, and I already mentioned this up above, but I wrote it down here as well, um, which is this warning that I gave to you up here. So this warning, I rewrote it down here. So it was so important that I said it twice. <laughs> so that warning right there is that writing right there, right? Beware, beware. Error, I just told us, the error for the, the keyword is within. When you see that within, that's your error, which I told us right here. I was getting ahead of myself, apparently. So look for how many, look for what sample size. Those are just the most common examples, but again, how big, how much, those would also work, right? How many, how big, how much, how big a sample, that kind of thing. I'll just write that. How big or how much? I wrote it up above, but I'll write it again down below. Okay. Now, the trickiest bit, <laughs> which is that there's some relationships between error and sample size and confidence interval and sample size and standard deviation and sample size. Now, this is not the same as the relationships we saw here. Now, in the confidence interval flow chart, we were looking at the margin of error every time, right? So we were looking at the error, the width, right? Width, 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 right? So when I'm talking about narrower versus wider, I'm talking about error. This particular group is all about sample size, n, right? The, the relationships are still what I wrote, or they're related to what I wrote on the previous page, but they're not exactly the same. So this is N that I'm talking about. So it's saying, okay, look, N goes what direction if your error goes what way, right? Well, remember that error and sample size, so error and sample size have an inverse relationship. Right. This I did write on the previous page. <laughs> this is the same thing. If n goes up, error goes down. If n goes down, error goes up. They're, they're reversed of each other. They're inverted. Confidence, the C level, right? so I can, I can give you guys an example here. If, n, if error goes up, n goes down. Okay, confidence has a direct relationship. So if N goes up, C level goes up. If N, well, or if vice versa, if C level goes up, N goes up. If C level goes down, N goes down. They have a direct relationship. And similarly, standard deviation also has a direct relationship. This was all gone over in section 9.4, so I'm just reiterating this. Um, so N will go up if your S goes up, N will go down if your S goes down. S is your standard deviation, N is your sample size. So those are the types of relationships we can have. 
one other thing to watch out for. One final note <laughs> that I didn't type in here, but we should have it. Remember that your confidence level can be high, right? 90%, percent, 95%, 99%, 99.9%, etc. You can go really, really high, but it can never be 100%. Because that would imply that we surveyed the whole population, right? That would imply that there's no um, doubt, right? In which case, there's no point in making a confidence interval because we know exactly what everybody thinks because we surveyed the whole population. 